Thank you. Um, we have seen a number of very exciting presentations today about uh, sensors, sensor networks, the data that is collected by sensor networks. And I would like to talk about um, an issue um, that is related to that, the visualization of the sensor network data. So, um, brief outline of my presentation. Um, we can um, see the problem of sensor network um, visualization as a problem of scattered data interpolation. I will briefly talk about this. And then I will present uh, a simple case study of sensor visualization, sensor network visualization, um, from the data collected um, on Great Dark Island. Then I will talk about um, a more um, complex domain and how we can represent more complex domains. And an important issue there is the appropriate distance metric that has to be used for complex domains. And I will conclude with a case study of such a more complex domain um, sensor network deployed in Corey Hall here on the UC Berkeley campus. So what are scattered data methods? Um, scattered data methods are appropriate for data sampled at irregular positions and at irregular intervals. And if you think about it, this is exactly um, the situation that we have with um, typical sensor networks. We deploy sensors. Um, the sensors are not necessarily, and uh, I think they are hardly ever, deployed at regular um, positions at regular intervals. They are deployed at arbitrary positions um, somewhere in the environment. And we also acquire the data not necessarily at regular time intervals. There are um, maybe sensor readings, then sensors um, might fail to transmit data for a certain period of time. Later, we might be able to pick up the um, sensor readings again. So there are irregularities both in the spatial and in the time domain. Scattered data methods try to interpolate or try to find, uh, uh, interpol uh, try to interpolate the underlying field that is actually being measured by the sensors. Um, so far, we have looked at some sensor readings in previous presentations, and these were primarily readings of an individual sensor. But if we have a, a large number of sensors, then we are not necessarily only interested in one particular sensor, but we are interested in the actual data that all these sensors are collecting. And you can think about this at uh, a sensor or sensors um, sampling data of a continuous underlying field, such as a temperature field um, uh, or a pressure field. Um, in order to do that, we can use these scattered data methods and we have to adapt um, these scattered data methods for um, various different distance metrics. One of the biggest problems that we face when we do that is that um, these methods which have been around for quite a long time, are currently still too slow for real-time visualization of um, live sensor data. Let me start with a case study of uh, Great Duck Island. In this case, we have, a, or we assume, a Euclidean domain without any restrictions. That means we um, assume our sensors are just deployed somewhere on um, this island and um, there are no walls or any obstacles between the different sensors that could influence um, the, the underlying uh, temperature field that is being measured. Um, the data that we were using for this experiment was the um, first collection of data measured on Great Duck Island um, using just a few dozen sensors that monitor the habitat of seabirds. Over a time period of three months, um, over a million sensor readings have been captured and stored. And there you can already see that there is a vast amount of data, even with a fairly small number of sensors. And if you imagine that um, you will eventually deploy 
thousands or millions of sensors and uh, measure data at uh, short time intervals, then you really have a, a large number of readings. Um, in this um, particular example, sensors had been placed above and below ground, and um, this led also to some interesting artifacts that we um, could observe when we first visualized the data. The um, next slide will show a sample reconstruction of the temperature field on Great Duck Island. And um, so the visualization depicts the temperature. Blue depicts uh, coldest and red warmest areas. And cooler spots are sensors located in burrows that are um, away from the sun. And here you see some here you see um, a reconstructed field, and you can um, see some of these spots here um, with different colors, and these represent sensor locations. And this is actually an interesting um, observation that we have here. Um, obviously, there are sensors where the temperature is much lower, um, like in these areas here, and uh, areas where we have a higher temperature. And we assumed for um, this visualization that um, there is essentially no difference between the sensors. So we just um, reconstructed this temperature field based on the distance um, to uh, any of these sensors here. And um, the reason why we did this is that we, at this point, did not have any additional meta information about the location of the sensors. And afterwards, we learned that these sensors here were actually uh, underground sensors. Um, and obviously, it does not make sense to interpolate between sensors that are above the surface and sensors that are below the surface. So you see here that this meta information uh, is also crucial to be able to interpret the data in a meaningful way. But I uh, nevertheless want you to, uh, wanted to show you um, this um, visualization. Um, we um, have also um, experimented with um, more recent um, data where we had um, meta information available, but it turned out that the um, visualization um, did not look particularly interesting. And that was because the temperature differences were not um, um, as um, we're not changing um, as much as here in, in this example. And um, uh, so I, that's why I included here this visualization. One other important issue is that um, the sensors do not measure the temperature at fixed time intervals, or at least they do not record the temperature at fixed time intervals. There are sensors who um, uh, measure data or send data um, for a, a number of time steps. And then um, we do not get any readings for a certain amount of time. And then sometimes sensors reappear and deliver data, or um, the sensors just die and never um, deliver any data. And it is important that we take this um, into account. Um, the reason is that we should weight sensors that measure data in larger time intervals with um, less accuracy than uh, sensors that measure data um, and deliver the measured data much more frequently. Um, on the next slide, we um, also see a visualization of the sensor relevance over time, again, using the example of the temperature field on Great Duck Island. And towards the top of the image, you see the reconstruction um, about an hour later than at the bottom. And um, also interesting to note is that cooler sensors on the left, uh, on the next slide, fades out um, of rel uh, relevance as it stops reporting. And um, here's this um, data set. So this is basically the temperature here on the x-axis, and we have time on this axis. And at the beginning, we um, can observe readings from um, multiple sensors. So this sensor here over time reads 
um, fairly high temperature. Um, towards the end, after an hour, we do not get any additional information. This sensor here is apparently an underground sensor and we um, can read, um, we get multiple readings from the sensor. Um, it's difficult to see here on the screen, but there is actually another sensor reading here. But for this sensor here, after a, a certain amount of time, there are no, uh, no additional readings. And what you see here in the resulting temperature field, and this is basically just one slice through time, is that um, the sensor here at the beginning of the measurements influences the whole field and when we stop receiving information, this influence is um, decreasing. And that means that this higher temperature area um, tends to move to the left, while here uh, at this point it is basically pushed to the right by the availability of the sensor readings from, the, from these sensors. And the same here for, uh, for this sensor. So what we learned is that scatter data interpolation methods are useful for visualizing um, both sensor data and also the status of the sensor network, which is also something very interesting um, because after the network, the sensors have been deployed, it is more difficult to um, evaluate the, the current state of the actual sensor network. Um, the underground sensors gave a, a fairly constant reading um, during day and night, whereas the above ground sensors uh, varied um, more upon, uh, based upon the time of day. But again, um, it is very important that um, as much meta information as possible is available to, um, to help with interpreting the data. If we just have the, um, even just have the spatial location of the sensor um, as it um, has been deployed uh, in the environment is not necessarily enough information to reconstruct a meaningful underlying data field. As many constraints as possible that could influence this field um, are available and are known, the better um, we can actually interpret the data. And of course, um, um, in the first example, it does not really make sense to um, equally weight above and underground sensors. So if there are constraints like that, we should really treat these sensors independently or maybe reconstruct separate underlying data fields and we should not mix these sensors here. Let me go to another more complex domain. Again, in the, for the Great Duck Island, we assumed a very simple, essentially flat domain without any walls or barriers between the sensors. But if we deploy sensors in buildings, for example, we have more complex domains. And here you see a floor plan um, of a building and um, you see hall, a hallway and several offices and uh, doors um, uh, into these offices. And the fundamental idea is that we try to represent these complex domains as a union of convex polyhedral sectors or cells that are explicitly connected by portal polygons. And again here, this is some important meta information that we take into account and have to take into account when we reconstruct the underlying fields. Based on this assumption here, we can represent these complex domains as undirected graphs, which makes it possible to calculate the distance between two query points. Here you see these uh, convex cells um, that are here separated by these um, dotted lines. And here you see the, um, the portal polygons that separate also these uh, individual sectors. If we would take the Euclidean metric as in the example for Great Duck Island, we would completely ignore the walls, we would completely ignore the boundaries 
And that would mean that we would interpolate here across the walls. And of course, that obviously does not make um, a lot of sense. So it is more um, appropriate to take here these doors and these portals into account. And um, one simple and quite efficient approach is to um, cross portals by connecting their centroids. So we have a, um, a position here um, of a sensor and we have a sensor position here. And then we connect this position with the um, centroid of the um, um, of these portal crossings and um, come up with a first non-optimized um, connection between these points. Of course, this is not the shortest path between these points and we can further optimize the position here along these portal crossings to determine um, the shortest connection between these points given the geometric constraints. And um, eventually it's a, it's a fairly simple iterative process uh, where we try to move these um, points here um, into a direction and when we observe that the distance becomes shorter then we um, continue moving the point in that direction until we hit a boundary of, um, of one of these sectors here. And then eventually we have a shortest path here between these points and then we can interpolate the underlying field based on that distance. This metric can be computed quite efficiently for uh, complex domains and it can be used as a drop in replacement for the typical Euclidean metric that is used in most common scattered data methods. Um, let me um, finish with a case study of Corey Hall. Corey Hall is a building not far away from here on the UC Berkeley campus. And there's a number of uh, sensors installed in rooms and hallways monitoring light and temperature. One objective is to minimize the number of sensors that are necessary and to optimize the sensor locations that we're able to measure the underlying temperature and um, illumination field as accurate as possible. And the goal is to balance sensor cost with accuracy. We have created a program that allows us to place sensors interactively and ideally we want to minimize the error given only a subset of sensors. So we start with a large number of sensors if you will, as reference, and then we reduce the number of sensors and we, can, um, we try to compare the quality of the reconstructed field with the smaller number of sensors. The next slide, um, red represents higher values. It's a simulated data set, so it can either be um, temperature or light or any scalar value um, that you want. Blue, lower values, and purple, um, average um, scalar values. This is actually the floor plan of Corey Hall, but it is not actually the sensor, um, the exact sensor location where the sensors had been deployed in Corey Hall, because again, this metadata is, um, is not available. And um, here you see the um, a simulated scalar field, um, and we sample this um, scalar field um, at um, these locations here and here we sample the same field at a smaller number of locations and what you see here in both cases is the reconstructed scalar field based on these samples. What we would like to do is um, to extend this to three-dimensional visualizations because so far we have only looked at two-dimensional sensor locations. We assumed that sensors were all on the same plane, either on the floor or um, um, at, at a given height in, uh, in a room. But of course, this is not the, the case in real environments. And we have to take the height of the sensor into account. So currently, we are only able to visualize slices through these, um, through these sensor network fields. 
One important issue is an error analysis for interactive sensor placements. We would like to um, visualize the error when we interactively place sensors in the environment. We would like to visualize the error in real time to find a, um, an optimal location or eventually also use this error metric to um, have an automatic placement of sensors. But still, even with an automatic placement, it is probably necessary that, the, that a user um, decides on the final position of the sensor because there are many more constraints in a typical room that are not represented by just having a floor plan available. There are um, constraints. I cannot just put a sensor at an arbitrary position in the room. Um, and uh, we have to take these constraints into account. Faster reconstructions, um, and that means um, faster methods for scattered data interpolation are important, and we um, experiment with local speed ups of uh, these methods. And then eventually, we would also like to have a virtual re reality walkthrough of a building where we could. Um, position sensors in a virtual environment at arbitrary locations. And finally, um, we would like to be able to visualize sensor data in real time. The data that I've shown so far is recorded data, and we have some time um, to process the data and to visualize the data. But eventually, it would be nice to um, visualize the data fields as it is being sent um, from the sensor network. Thank you. Any questions for Oliver? Yes. No, we have not. But would definitely be um, be interesting. The more additional information we have about the location of the sensors and the. Um, especially in a GIS system where we have additional information, um, multiple layers of information, um, the better is the, the guess that we can make about the underlying uh, uh, data field. Good. Thank you. Thank you all for staying. You stayed to the bitter, to the bitter end. And thank you, Oliver, for a great talk. Um,